Good morning, everyone. I'm Nico Popetko. I'm the head of wider Euro program at the European Council of Foreign Relations. And we're here today uh, to discuss the future of Eastern Partnership. It's an event organized uh, by ECFR, as you probably know, in, uh, in cooperation with ECFR's Paris office. And the starting point of this event, uh, to me at least uh, intellectually, has been always a new dynamic in the European conversation about uh, the future of the European Union in foreign policy. And since the uh, commission headed by Ursula von der Leyen took over a year and a half ago, we have seen a new dynamic and a new energy behind the conversation as to what does it mean for Europe to be geopolitical? What does it mean for Europe to be uh, strategically autonomous? Uh, what does it mean for Europe to be more powerful? And in France, uh, you often hear this term Europe puissance. Um, we also uh, hear calls and a renewed desire to strengthen again uh, and re-intensify the transatlantic partnership, both on issues related to the economy, but also on foreign policy coordination. So with all of that in mind, I always thought that the road to a stronger Europe lies through the strengthening of Europe's regional policies be it in the Middle East, in Africa, in the Balkans, or in the Eastern Partnership. So one question which I have been asking myself and everyone I could uh, have a serious conversation about these issues is basically this question that I ask, you know, what does it mean and what do we need to do in the Balkans, in the Middle East, in the Eastern Partnership, if we want a stronger, more influential Europe, a Europe that is more influential vis-a-vis -vis our partner states, be it Serbia or Morocco or Georgia or Ukraine, but also vis-a-vis -vis third powers, be it Turkey, Russia, China, uh, Iran, even, you know, and the list can continue. So with this in mind, uh, we thought that it would be great to have this conversation on how do we need to adapt the Eastern partnership to this European ambition to be a more forceful and more international and influential voice in, in foreign affairs both globally and regionally. And we have an amazing uh, panel uh, with three great speakers. Uh, and some of the you know, back office preparation for that is that the, the inspiration for this event and for this panel came from the fact that uh, Lina Slinkiewicz has recently been to Paris. Um, and uh, we thought that it would be good to have a conversation uh, more or less around that trip. Uh, and with that, I will invite Linas to take the floor. Uh, Linas is, uh, Linas Linkiewicz does not need to be introduced uh, until very recently he has been foreign minister of Lithuania, um, a very forceful voice in the last decade uh, in uh, European foreign policy, uh, someone who has worked tirelessly in the last decade to make Europe a stronger uh, voice, both in Eastern Europe, but on plenty of other dossiers. Uh, and with that, Linas, I invite you to take the floor. And I will just mention that the, the fact that Linas is now uh, ambassador at large at the Lithuanian MFA. Linas, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nico. And also good to see all familiar faces. So a uh, complicated issue indeed. Uh, ambitions are high to be geopolitical. And sometimes I have to say that uh, some colleagues are denying that this is geopolitical, what we are talking or I would disagree because everything now it's overlapping and interlinked and related, especially Eastern Partnership, I would say it's becoming geopolitical because uh, the facts are on the ground, you know, because of that choice, these countries experiencing almost all of them experiencing hot or, or frozen conflicts. And uh, this is also a witness of, of this uh, kind of uh, developments which cannot be neglected. And now if we want to be uh, geopolitical, if we want to have to extend with some kind of influence, uh, really uh, have to meet expectations of these countries. Although these expectations are really, really very different. If we'll single out uh, three associated countries out of these six, they also very different, but all of them also suffering because of the choice. In Ukraine, we have war, still aggression ongoing because of the choice. In Moldova is Transnistria, in Georgia is also 20% of territory uh, occupied and uh, this borderization process from time to time uh, taking place. 
So again, because of that choice, others, others three are even more complicated than before because two of them are fighting be between each, each other. Uh, now it's calm, calming down a bit, but nevertheless, tension is very high, very difficult for them to agree on literally anything. If we are com talking about common thinking, common documents, and Belarus out of picture because of the developments of that country. And we agreed in, in European Union in October last year that the relations with that country will be not political before they will make uh, major changes, uh, new elections, release political prisoners. So at least what should be done in order to get back to normal, normal dialogue. So uh, this is really uh, easy to say that uh, the uh, partnership program should be inclusive, which is needless to say, it's important, one of the principles. But also, also self-differentiation must be respected. Otherwise, we will not able will not be able to move ahead. So, therefore, uh, now we are in the process of uh, preparations for possible Eastern Partnership Summit. Uh, I hope in October it will possible to take place in person, uh, preferably. And uh, it's not yet decided, but this is important to 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 make sure it will happen. Also, it's not decided whether there will be joint declaration, as always, it's very difficult to draft. But again, I believe we should be ambitious enough to try at least to do that. That's important. And as I said, uh, to respect both principles, inclusiveness and cell differentiation. So in short, I, I would say that we must repeat in this joint, joint declaration uh, major principles of European aspirations of, of these countries, those who have chosen the way also to res respecting territorial integrity, which is very important for all of them. This is political statements. Uh, I believe we have to think about gradual integration into EU uh, internal markets, although there are a, a lot of skepticism saying that it's too early. Uh, these countries, especially association countries, they didn't implement everything what was envisaged uh, in the association agreements. But I would remind that it's, uh, we are ready. Uh, having, uh, we are already doing that in this gradual integration in, in, in the single market uh, taking place uh, with implementation of association agreements at DCFTA, uh, looking at the sectorial, so to say, approach. But nevertheless, it's already started, so it's not revolutionary. We have to take stock and to build upon that to, to show some progress, I have no doubt. We should uh, think about uh, mechanisms how to in, in, involve uh, partners in, in uh, security cooperation. And Nico, you're also quite active in this regard. And I believe it's really a very right approach. Those who wish so, those who are ready, and that would be really helpful for them nationally and definitely regionally. Uh, here, EU can play a role, again, consolidating role, and also with regard to the standards, uh, principles, uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's the case uh, to do. Uh, when briefly talking about self-differentiation, nobody prohibits these three associated countries to be more active than others in the context of that agreement. So they really can uh, be active in coordinating uh, the efforts, also coming up with the common agenda, suggesting initiatives to European Union, a sectorial dialogue uh, would be also, uh, I believe, a very useful thing because there are areas where really they can be engaged. And that could be uh, also like energy, like transport, communication, uh, connectivity initiatives. I'm always saying that when we're talking about all kinds of uh, reforms, it's important to, to see the visibility and, uh, and they, they should be understandable for the, for the people tangible, so to say. The changes should be also visible and clear, same as it was with visa, visa liberalization process and those visa, visa free for associated countries. So I believe it was very important. But again, if you agree with me, and by the way, Nico, in particular you, I'm not sure that it was sold out to the people properly because it was taken sometimes like a given, you know, like, like normal thing, which was not so easily done. Uh, they needed to conduct reforms and to go through the process, and that was a big achievement. But people uh, took, uh, took that like natural thing, which is, well, <laughs> fine, but <laughs> nevertheless, it's really important achievement. So uh, going along the, this way, I believe uh, initiatives like connectivity, special initiatives like roaming projects for it, that will be clear for the people, helps 
and maybe maybe facilitates the process. So we have to think about initiatives which and projects which are tangible, visible, clear for the people, uh, increase uh, motivation to continue with the reforms, and that's exactly our goal. So, uh, well, in short, as I said, it's introductory remarks. I believe it's plenty of ideas on the table. The major point is not to retreat, you know, not to go backwards because ambitions are, should remain the same. We really have to build upon what was done and to see some progress to go to, to make sure that we, we have we're advancing, but not to going back. Um, uh, to, to skeptics, I would say and would remind that uh, Eastern Partnership was always balancing between life and death, you know, <laughs> even eight years ago, if uh, when Ukrainians didn't sign a station agreement in Vilnius, uh, many, many told that uh, the Eastern Partnership is over, it's closed, it's dead, you know, well, it's no, no possible to go ahead. We see still, we're still alive. We're talking about some kind of dynamism. Uh, we're talking about very concrete initi initiatives. And I believe this is exactly uh, the lines uh, along which we should uh, go ahead and uh, trying to convince uh, skeptics. So uh, how, how is important to have this uh, united approach, needless to say, and uh, my discussions in Paris a few days ago were exactly about that, that we should remain ambitious, uh, we shouldn't stop the process, uh, we should meet expectations of these partners, especially when things are developing and so dynamically and the pro problems around are not decreasing, but even increasing. It's not just pandemics, but also other, other problems. And we cannot solve one problem at the expense of others. So this is really uh, not the privilege we have. And we have to really continue uh, with, with the program, which was very useful. Uh, it was useful, not just for European Union, but first of all, for the partners. And uh, now it's decisive time. So. And let's uh, take it, uh, let's do our, our best, and let's move ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Linas. Uh, and now I would like to invite Petra Gombalova to share the latest thinking in Brussels on the future of Eastern Partnership. Uh, and Petra is head of uh, division at the External Action Service in charge of the Eastern Partnership Regional Cooperation and the OSCE. Petra, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Nico. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very happy uh, that I can uh, be with you today. Uh, Lina's already mentioned a number of uh, issues, so I would like to go uh, and echo some of them and also a bit uh, shed the light on what we are working now in terms of the future agenda for the Eastern Partnership and as well as what we have in mind for the, for the summit. I would like to echo what Linas was saying indeed that the situation in the region is not the easiest one and uh, indeed uh, it seems that the problems are increasing but as he exactly said uh, the Eastern Partnership in, is alive and I would even say that uh, probably it's, uh, it's getting even stronger. We all know uh, all the, the challenges and uh, we have the common responsibility to uh, keep, uh, keep the framework alive, to strengthen it. And uh, this is what, what we have in mind uh, for, the, for the future agenda. Uh, you may uh, know that uh, in 2019, we had a very uh, comprehensive public consultation with different st stakeholders. We continued last year, despite the pandemic, we were working uh, together with partners on uh, shaping of the future agenda, future targets uh, for, the, for our cooperation. And these, uh, the main lines, uh, political lines of, uh, of our future uh, agenda are mentioned in the joint communication on the future of business partnership. Let me just echo the five areas uh, and uh, highlight that the resilience, uh, increased resilience of partners in the broader sense is the, the main overarching uh, uh, priority. We will also look uh, into increasing resilience and cooperation in areas like economy, uh, with the connectivity, uh, rule of law, uh, accountable institutions, security, green and digital transitions, and uh, as well as inclusive uh, societies. 
I would like to also stress on this point that uh, looking back, when you look back to uh, 2009, uh, when the Eastern Partnership was conceived, and on the progress which we achieved, I think that uh, without, uh, without any modesty, we need to be proud uh, on what we achieved together. We see the partners uh, closer to the European Union. We see uh, their uh, advances in trade, uh, in trade cooperation, in mobility. I'm very happy that Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine can profit from uh, visa-free travel. Uh, to the EU, we see a lot of advancement as regards mobility, connectivity, energy, and uh, energy efficiency. And we, I believe, we have to build on these achievements. And also, uh, we are building the future on the common, uh, on the joint uh, strong foundations. And here, I mean common val values and fundamentals: good governance, the rule of law. Uh, enabling environment for civil society, freedom of media, respect for human rights. It's true that this is not probably very visible for the people, but this is the, the key uh, pre uh, prerequisite uh, for any, any further development of any, any society. In this sense, uh, and looking on the different, uh, and discussing with member, uh, member states, discussing with partners, we have, uh, we are going to propose a, a new uh, or renewed agenda, which will, uh, which will follow the, the main structure of the joint communication, which will definitely reiterate that, that fundamental uh, comes first, that this is important to continue reforms uh, in, uh, like for example, in justice to fight corruption and really incre uh, increase uh, the fair and inclusive uh, societies. These are the areas where we see that uh, there still uh, is work to be done. We very much here, and uh, Nico, uh, we had uh, many discussions on this, and this is the security. Uh, security really features very highly on the agenda, also in our discussions, in discussions with partners and uh, discussions with, uh, with member states, uh, civil society, with think tanks. And uh, we, we, are, we, we are listening to that. We have, of course, limits, which I don't want to uh, repeat probably here now, but we want to look on how to increase the sector of cooperation, for example, hybrid, cyber threats. We want to encourage the partners to uh, participate in the European Union CSDP missions. We uh, want, to, uh, want to also look into how, how we could use the European Peaceful Facility. And of course, I, can, I cannot not mention uh, the strategic compass, which will envisage also a strengthened uh, partnership with, uh, with countries uh, on, uh, on security. Uh, another very important point which, uh, which, uh, which comes uh, uh, in play is also the twin transition, digital and, uh, and uh, green transition. We want partners to be equally ambitious as we are, as the European Union is uh, in line with the, uh, with the European Green Deal. And we will also focus uh, our agenda uh, on these uh, two, uh, two uh, key issues. Of course, uh, our aim is also to make sure that uh, nobody is left behind, that, uh, that uh, I can the partners are more uh, competitive, innovative, and then of course uh, also uh, bring uh, more opportunities uh, for jobs, uh, especially for the young people. And this is another very important area where we want to focus our, our work uh, with the partners, and this is, uh, this is youth. Uh, well, uh, Linus also mentioned a bit uh, pandemic, but also other uh, other challenges. Also on the on the pandemic, uh, I would just to echo that uh, we have, uh, thanks to the Team Europe support, provided substantial uh, support to uh, to partner countries. We will continue so uh, to do so. And of course, uh, another issue which uh, is highly prominent in the in the discussions with the partners are vaccines. So we will also we are looking also in, into uh, uh, into this, and uh, we very much believe that uh, successful uh, vaccine rollout will uh, will will continue. Now a bit on the on the summit, um, uh, we are building we are building the narrative of the summit uh, according to the three main strands, and this is of course the the joint work on recovery. Uh, this is uh, something which is connected also to reforms, uh, uh, but uh, notably uh, to the economic recovery. And uh, we will uh, propose the economic and investment plan uh, to this end uh, for the summit. 
Uh, then another issue which I already mentioned is resilience. Uh, so this will remain uh, the key uh, key feature of our future uh, future agenda. And uh, last but not least, uh, reforms. This is uh, a set uh, prerequisite for further uh, further discussions and further work. Um, Lina's mentioned the uh, differentiations and inclusivity. Indeed, we have these tensions all the time in uh, in the Eastern Partnership, uh, inclusivity, differentiations. And I would like to highlight that our work uh, for the future will respect this uh, dual approach. We will uh, we 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 are aware that our partners have uh, different ambitions. They have uh, different. Uh, they want to choose the different pace and. We want to make sure that uh, all, uh, they that they can pros proceed along uh, along their uh, their wishes. Uh, this means that for those who want to engage more uh, for us, of course, we will uh, we will be more than happy to explore the avenues uh, on how how to how to work. Uh, but uh, I would like to highlight as well inclusivity. Uh, indeed, it's not uh, not an easy uh, task. And uh, Lina has also mentioned the issue of joint declaration for the summit. Uh, this uh, this will be a very tricky and bumpy road. Uh, very much hope that we will find uh, the compromise and uh, we will find the common ground uh, in uh, uh, with all uh, all partners and member states, uh, so that we may uh, we have a successful, ambitious uh, joint declaration. Uh, finally, uh, on the summit, uh, uh, one uh, one final point, and this is uh, exactly like coming back uh, to what Linas and I said at the beginning, and this is like that Eastern Partnership. Uh, there is, uh, or like I would say that summit probably under current circumstances is more important than ever. We need to seize this opportunity. We need to make sure that uh, Eastern Partnership continues. Uh, it's it's uh, getting stronger. And uh, we have to send this message of uh, un unity uh, to uh, to the world. Uh, this also means that we have we, we should not shy away uh, from highlighting all the positive achievements and look on how how we make uh, the uh, how we make the partnership uh, grow stronger. So I would stop here, and I'm then happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Petra, Petra, for this uh, great and comprehensive update. And now I would like to invite Pierre Vimont to share his thoughts on how he sees an ambitious Europe in Eastern Europe. Uh, and Pierre, of course, needs no in introductions, but I will just remind everyone that Pierre has a, 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 it's like a very rich career in French and European diplomacy. He has been Secretary General of the External Action Service in Brussels, former French ambassador to the United States. Now he's a senior associate at Carnegie Europe. Um, and in his free time or in his main time, he's also a, a special ambassador, a special envoy of the French president for dialogue with Russia. And that is a position that Pierre has been uh, filling in after the Bregenson summit between France and Russia, which, as we all know, uh, gave a new dynamic to the bilateral dialogue at the time. Uh, remains to be seen uh, whether that new dynamic, uh, you know, is equally new now or continues. But Pierre, the floor is yours, and then we can dig uh, into the details of the dynamic later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nico. And Thank you for inviting me and uh, for allowing me to um, have this dialogue with Petra and, and Linas, um, who are both um, uh, people that I, I, I respect a lot and um, whose voice I think is very important to, uh, to listen to. Um, I, I think the way you introduced the, the, uh, the discussion, Niku, was exactly spot on, in my opinion. Uh, you know, um, the Eastern Partnership is a very good illustration of what a geopolitical Europe means um, today. Uh, um, it's, a, it's a very good um, playground, I would say, to see whether Europe is, is able to uh, live up to what is expected from it today. And uh, out of what Lina said and Petra said, um, I totally agree with everything that was said there, with the uh, idea that uh, we need to uh, upgrade our act and, and not go backwards, as Linas was saying. 
um, listening also to the three priorities, the three R's that uh, uh, Petra uh, put forward for the next summit, recovery, resilience, reform. All this I think is, is uh, very well, and I, I'm sure everyone could agree with this. But the problem is how to insert all these uh, great ideas into the uh, geopolitical reality of, of today. Because, um, and that would be maybe the, the two observations I would make. One is that the Eastern uh, partnership dates back uh, to a period at the 2008, 2009, that was quite different, uh, where the geopolitical reality in this part of the European continent was quite different from what it is today. And my second observation will be, uh, of course, that how do we do now? How do we handle this new reality? Uh, because um, that's, that's the real issue we're facing today. On, on the first observation, just a quick, uh, a quick few, uh, a few points there. The whole idea, if you remember well, when we started the Eastern Partnership, was this whole idea that we were going to set up a ring of friends. Everything but the treaty was uh, the motto at the time. And as I think, if I remember well, the Economist in one of its cover put it at the, a few years later, we have run from the ring of friends to the ring of fire. Um, and this has been a totally different reality that we're still facing today. As Linus was saying, just. Uh, uh, just look at uh, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh uh, area, uh, to some extent also the growing pressure on, on Moldova that you know all too well, Niku. All this has transformed uh, the whole situation. Uh, and th the other point I, I would make is that um, at the time, the Eastern Partnership was trying to create an area of non-confrontation. Um, and in fact, we have gone exactly in the other direction. Um, this is an area of, uh, I would say to some extent at the moment, permanent confrontation. Um, and um, here again, this is something that we have to take into account. Uh, there was also this idea of transformation uh, of those Eastern partners. And today we have slowly moved into something a bit different. Uh, we're talking about resilience. In fact, it, um, it came out already in 2016 with the EU global strategy where the, the word was more about resilience and, um, and not as much about transforming uh, deeply and thoroughly um, the, um, the, the economy and the societies of these Eastern partners. And I think here again, we need to take that into account to understand a little bit better where, where, where we are. Um, could I add also another point? Uh, this is um, uh, uh, an area where um, influence from outside players um, is growing. It's not only about Russia, it's also about China, which is becoming more and more present in that area. It's about Turkey. And it's maybe about other outside players uh, that want to join in and have more presence and more influence. So in, uh, in, uh, in a nutshell, um, we had set up um, uh, a sort of framework for the Eastern Partnership. It's still very much there. It is going on through uh, the usual process that we enjoy in Brussels, summits with uh, uh, difficult uh, fight between member states about the, uh, uh, the, the statement at the end of the summit. Um, it's about uh, quite often the accession issue that comes time and again and without uh, ever being able to find a sort of, of common uh, answer and would paper out some sort of uh, compromise that is never ever satisfying to, to both sides. And it's mostly about money, the kind of financial resources we're ready to dedicate to these, um, to these Eastern partners. And there, you know, the competition is between Eastern partnership and Southern neighborhood. And we have gone time and again through these issues where um, without um, ever set complete satisfactory uh, outcome. And why I think we are there today is precisely because, and that's my second observation, 
because we need to look at the broad picture and to maybe go more deeply uh, between the EU institution and the member states into trying to get a better understanding of what we're looking for. Um, because when we're talking about a geopolitical Europe, a Europe that can speak the language of power, as I've heard time and again, the whole issue, for me, it's, it's, it's threefold. It's what are our interests, our deep-rooted um, uh, deep interests um, between all of us, our common interest with regard to Eastern partnership, as again, I, I would underline, as it is also the case with the whole of the neighborhood policy. And there I would insist, neighborhood is the first priority in foreign policy for, uh, for the EU. This is where we need to put all our energy, all our dynamics in, in trying to come up with a strong, solid, uh, cohesive uh, neighborhood policy. Uh, so what are our interests? Um, is it about transforming those uh, societies uh, in the Eastern neighborhood? Is it maybe more broadly about how to bring back some stability and some security in, in this whole Eastern neighborhood? Because Eastern neighborhood is right there at the heart of our whole um, vision of what a more stable European continent should be all about. And we need to ask ourselves some real questions uh, out of this. And from there on, the second uh, aspect is what kind of strategy do we want to have? What are the main lines of that strategy? And there, to some extent, I think we need to be able to discuss among ourselves some of these difficult, sensitive issues we have been, you know, papering out more or less in, in a good way uh, on, 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 during all these years. Accession, yes, we need to have a thorough discussion about accession with our Eastern partners. If only because according to the treaty, uh, they are allowed um, to be a candidate for that. You know, it's, it's, it's a bit different uh, from the situation we're facing with our uh, partners from the Southern neighborhood. Here, the Eastern partners have a right uh, to call for, um, um, for us to look at the accession process. Um, and I think we need to have a thorough debate among ourselves about what this means and to give clear indications um, to our Eastern partners about how we intend to move there. At the moment when we're launching the conference on the future of Europe, accession should be among the EU member states um, a main topic of uh, discussion among us. Um, uh, but it's also about other issue. It's also about, if we discuss about resilience, it must be a way of discussing the way we want to move ahead with our Eastern partners um, on some important issue. I was quite struck recently looking at the EU mediation in Georgia, for instance, that has been so far successful, and I think we should all applaud at what the uh, uh, EU institution managed to do there, uh, because for me, it's a very good illustration of what a geopolitical Europe should be uh, in terms of foreign policy, more agile, more proactive, able to move ahead. But what is coming out of that mediation in Georgia is quite interesting. It's about moving ahead with the reform of the judiciary and trying to give it more um, independence. It's about fighting corruption. It's about uh, uh, allowing more space for the opposition, so on and so forth. These are the kind of issues I think we need to push forward in our discussion with our other Eastern partners, where we can um, have it, um, as, uh, as in Ukraine, for instance, or in Moldova. Um, I, think, uh, I think this is also the kind of goals we must be looking for. And of course, there is also security. You know it all, uh, Niku, as you came out with this idea of security compact. Uh, but it seems to me that looking at security, what we need to look for is where our interests lie when we discuss um, different items into the security field. Um, uh, the fights against cyber attack, um, the kind of um, enhanced partnership we can have here and there with our um, uh, uh, Eastern uh, neighbors. 
uh, once again, what should be the guidelines for me, um, in my opinion, is really looking at our strategic interest and looking how they uh, unfold um, in the security sector as in other sector. At the end of the day, and here again, I would like to underline this point, as we try to upgrade our, our act, it's about how we can build a more secure and, and stable European continent. And to me, um, the Eastern Partnership is key uh, to that new security order we, we want to build in. And so once again, to repeat what I said at the beginning, it's by looking at the broader picture and trying to give answers to some of these issues that are there, that we will be able to push forward uh, and to improve and upgrade our Eastern partnership. I've been too long, Nico, and I apologize. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre. Um, important issues need in-depth in discussions. So um, now, thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, I would like to invite the... Um, participants to address their questions through the questions and answers box. Uh, you can write your questions and I will try to group them and address them to the speakers. And I will already start with some of some questions I would have, and I would, I would have several which would give the time for the participants to uh, also formulate their own questions. So one question I would have is that while we talk about the need for Europe to be more geopolitical. There is this ongoing mantra that the Eastern Partnership is not and should not be geopolitical. Um, I keep hearing that for 10 years, uh, I haven't seen this changing very much in the last couple of years. So my question in a sense is, and of course, uh, we can all presume that the European Union has been trying to present uh, the Eastern Partnership as a non-geopolitical initiative, as a way to assuage and to diminish Russian opposition, concerns, and worries regarding the Eastern Partnership. Uh, of course, after the war in Ukraine in 2014, that fear has not necessarily, you know, that way of managing Russian sensitivities have not necessarily materialized. So. My question is, why do we still fear to just assume and say that a geopolitical Europe also means a geopolitically minded enlargement policy to the Balkans, a geopolitical approach to the Middle East, but also a geopolitical Eastern partnership? And the sub question to that, when we say if the Eastern partnership is and should not be geopolitical, does it mean that the whole European Union policy in Eastern Europe should not be geopolitical or just the Eastern partnership policy. And there are some other channels, be it bilateral, be it from, you know, run from the council that can be geopolitical. It's kind of a bit of a teleological question, but um, fundamentally the question I have is why do we fear to call it geopolitical? The second question somehow related to this is this uh, question uh, is this dimension Pierre that you raised about the greater security order stable continent and of course that's completely logical that Europe cannot have an eastern partnership policy without keeping in mind the Russia factor and having a Russia policy that kind of fits in with its eastern partnership policy um, and that eastern European security is not just about Ukraine it's also about Russia or vice versa. It's not just about Russia, but it's also about Ukraine. So the question there to all the speakers is, what exactly can we do more in the Eastern partnership on the sensitive security issues, but still stay below the risk of a major new conflagration with Russia? Can we do more? Can we be more ambitious in the Eastern partnership, not least on the security front, while not risk new major crises with Russia? Or you think what has been done so far and the current framework of Eastern partnership is just as much as the European Union member states could swallow in terms of European Union ambition in the region? Uh, and the third point I would like to raise 
is maybe we can dig in a bit into this vaccine diplomacy story. Um, and Petra, maybe you could give us, you know, the latest update uh, on uh, the conversation in Brussels on that. And what worries me from a side is that a year ago, the European Union has had an insufficiency in masks. So it, it was not in a position to be a very active mask diplomacy player. Uh, the European Union has launched this team Europe effort where, you know, several billion dollars, I think it, uh, several, several billion euro, maybe even up to 20 billion were offered to partner countries um, in, as economic aid to help them manage the economic impact of COVID. So whereas the European Union could not do much on, on the mask diplomacy front, it could do uh, quite a lot on the economic help related to COVID. Now we have a situation where, again, the European Union is in a situation where there is an insufficiency of vaccines for the European Union. And if I read the news, I would see, you know, Sputnik going to all kinds of, to many countries. Uh, I would see Chinese um, vaccines going to many countries, including in the European neighborhood and candidate countries. Uh, I saw that announcement that the United States um, are ready to distribute some 60 million AstraZeneca vaccines to, to partner countries. Uh, so the question is, you know, whether and to what extent the European Union can start and whether there is thinking about not now, but about, you know, what and what could Europe do in terms of vaccine diplomacy in autumn or maybe next years. And the sub question to that to Petra is related to this uh, green digital certificate, the so called vaccine passports. And I think we're heading to a situation where uh, we will have a lot of people who got vaccinated outside the European Union. Uh, but again, I'm not sure to what extent this digital certificate is being coordinated with partner countries and whether at some point uh, we're preparing the need for compatibility between. Uh, the documents and the vaccine certificates issued by partner countries, be it Serbia, be it Russia, be it Turkey or Ukraine, uh, so that people who are vaccinated uh, but are not inside the EU could also travel into the EU. Uh, and, you know, Petra, if you could just give us a sense of whether that political conversation is happening uh, or not yet. So with this, I would like to invite the speakers to perhaps come with some reactions and maybe I start with Pierre and we go in reverse order. <laughs> These are, are great questions, Niku, and uh, it's always difficult to answer in, in, a, in, a, in a short way. Um, on, on your first point, um, uh, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that um, 2014 and the Ukrainian uh, crisis uh, was um, a, a breaking point in our Eastern partnership. It made uh, uh, the whole situation totally different. And it brought in um, uh, the, um, the geopolitical uh, dimension uh, that I think many of us uh, wanted to avoid. Uh, but I think it's very difficult to push back against that uh, uh, geopolitical reality that is there. Uh, um, and I know that time and again in Brussels, uh, the EU institution have been uh, repeating um, that we're not in a competitive mood with regard um, on uh, Eastern partnership. That is not about spheres of influence fighting each other, but the reality on the ground shows that this is to a very large extent exactly what is happening. And here again, I would go a little bit further than just trying to look at this in a sort of binary dimension between Russia and the EU. Here again, I would underline other, other actors, other players are stepping in. Um, I was mentioning China and Turkey. Uh, I could also mention, of course, our former um, uh, member state, uh, United Kingdom, uh, which rightly, in my opinion, uh, it tends to have uh, and to keep its influence and to increase its influence there. So this is the political reality we're facing, and we have to take time and take that into account, because the reality is that we have been doing geopolitical geopolitics 
by stealth uh, to some extent in, in recent years. So better open our eyes and admit that and uh, to play it smartly um, as we go ahead, not in terms of confrontation. And I think all too often when we say uh, that we want to be more geopolitical, we intend to say that we want to be more confrontational. Uh, and this is not my point. Um, my point is if we want to have a strategic vision, we need to understand the situation in which we intend to act and to move. And we need to adapt our policy to that reality. This is what, in my opinion, it is uh, all about. On, on the security issue, uh, the problem we're facing there, of course, is, as I was saying earlier, the whole issue of, uh, of, um, of, um, of uh, the stability of the continent. And it seems to me that this is where the European Union has to do its homework um, for obvious reasons, because some of our member states, um, most of the and all of most of the Eastern partners um, were not part of the um, Helsinki um, uh, uh, Convention, were not part of the Paris Charter that was uh, uh, um, agreed in, in 1990. Uh, there is a need to update and upgrade our thinking, our conception of what a, 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 sta a, a European stability uh, should be all about. Uh, and we need to discuss that because that, of course, has a direct link with uh, the whole security matter. It means um, discussing that with our NATO partners, discussing that with, uh, with our European um, member states, and to try, um, not in, uh, in, in a quick way, but uh, uh, by discussing, thinking this uh, through all the different channels, um, in, in formal discussion between member states, think tanks, etc. We need to find slowly a better understanding of where we want to go. Um, your security compact ideas are very interesting one, but what is needed in my opinion is that it needs to be inserted into a more geopolitical framework, a better understanding of uh, what we want uh, to reach out for. Um, and this is what, in my opinion, is missing uh, today. It won't happen in a day, it won't happen in a month, but if we don't have this feeling that we need to start discussing this big issue, we will go nowhere. Uh, let me go back one minute on the whole uh, accession issue. Um, um, my point is, is, is the following. It's, um, I wonder to some extent whether we need to go onto all these um, um, difficult discussions among ourselves, the 27 member states, about accession when we're not even um, united on how among the 27 of us we need to move ahead uh, with the present uh, union. Um, divergence on the rule of law, uh, divergence about uh, how uh, to make our institutions work more efficiently, so on and so forth. So the real issue there is maybe that we need to look about the whole membership issue in a little bit of a different way, as we have done it to some extent with the Western Balkans country, um, in trying to go for a more progressive approach, a more incremental approach with regard to, to accession. And that maybe this is also a way of looking how to discuss this uh, among ourselves and with our Eastern partners. A new mindset, in other words, a new way of looking at this. Um, lastly, on the vaccine diplomacy, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, vaccine has become a major item in the um, uh, diplomacy of influence and presence, uh, and we're witnessing that every day. But here I would leave it to Petra to keep us updated maybe on what is going on. But let's not forget that so far the European Union has been the only, um, how could I say, main actor uh, that has been exporting, uh, at least in the Western world, that has been exporting uh, a lot of its jabs already. You know, nearly one third of the jabs we have at the moment has been exported to our outside partners. 
we're not saying that too loudly, I guess, for domestic political reasons, maybe, but that's the reality. Um, and uh, we should be proud of this and not try to hide it, uh, as perhaps we're doing it um, a little bit too much today. That's it. Thank you very much, Pierre. Uh, Petra? Yes, yeah, sorry, I have some uh, connection issues some uh, sometimes are yeah. Uh, yeah, on the on the geopolitics, I think uh, Pierre uh, answered it all. Um, uh, so I would uh, probably uh, go directly uh, to the issues you ask uh, uh, ask uh, Niku on uh, on health and vaccines. Uh, of course, uh, health uh, resilience uh, will be one of the issues which will be also addressed in our, our discussions or in our future agenda. And uh, it's not only about COVID as such, but it's uh, about the resilience of the whole, uh, whole, uh, whole uh, health sector in the partner countries uh, as, uh, as such. Uh, we are also, uh, as you might know, we are also in the process of the programming of the, of the, few, of the NDK. Uh, instrument and uh, this will be also part of our initiatives under and the team uh, team Europe so we will continue to express uh, and uh, solidarity not only in words but also uh, in, uh, in, uh, in clear actions as regards the uh, the vaccines of course this is as I said is very high on the agenda this is also something we are well aware and uh, we are doing our best uh, to support our partners. Uh, we are doing so through two channels. One is COVAX. So we have delivered uh, vaccines uh, to uh, all uh, partners, uh, if I don't, I'm not mistaken, uh, apart from, uh, from Belarus. Uh, and we are going to continue to do so. And uh, as you know, uh, in uh, solidarity with, uh, with, uh, with uh, countries, uh, not only partners, but all, all with uh, also other uh, countries in other continents, the European Union has delivered 200 million doses of uh, vaccines which were shipped uh, from, from Europe uh, to, those, uh, to those countries. And uh, unlike some others who, who go and promise uh, vaccines. Uh, uh, and uh, another issue is uh, that uh, member states are also working uh, very hard on sort of uh, vaccine sharing mechanism. And I'm very happy that, uh, for example, Romania has already delivered uh, some, uh, some uh, doses to, uh, uh, to Moldova. And uh, I hear that there are some other countries like Poland uh, who are now in discussions on, uh, on how, to, uh, how to provide support to, to others and uh, other will follow. And uh, so, uh, so I think that uh, uh, although we were of course slow at the beginning, I think that we are now getting uh, up to the speed and uh, we very much hope that uh, this, uh, this, will, uh, this will pick up in next uh, weeks, uh, in weeks and, uh, and months. Uh, and maybe just uh, go back to geopolitics and uh, security and so on. We always say that um, uh, the Eastern Partnership is not a conflict resolution mechanism. Uh, we are not using it to resolve the conflict, but it's, uh, it plays an important role in conflict prevention. And uh, there, here I come again uh, with the issue of uh, resilience. Uh, uh, in the, the broadest sense. And this is not only about cyber hybrid, but as also Pierre uh, mentioned, uh, it's all about uh, fundamental first. This, uh, this is uh, sort of uh, uh, important for each of the society to, to remain uh, strong and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and deal, 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 in, deal, develop uh, in a in balanced uh, manner. And of course, we uh, we also uh, we also uh, look into the uh, as I mentioned uh, to very concrete uh, areas of cooperation on security. Uh, we uh, uh, I would like to reiterate the the cyber uh, cooperation, hybrid cooperation, CSDP. Uh, we'll also have a uh, have a, or there are still ongoing discussions on the strategic compass. Uh, which will play an important role as well as PESCO uh, and uh, European uh, Peace uh, Facility. And uh, I forgot one thing, and these are the green certificate. Uh, yeah, so uh, the discussions, uh, discussions on the green certificates are still ongoing. This will be also part of the discussion on the next uh, European summit on the 25th of May. 
for the time being, as my understanding is that we are focusing on the European side of the, of the whole story, but the international dimension uh, is present. And I'm sure once we have more clarity, we will also develop uh, on, on that front. So thanks a lot this uh, so far from my side. Thank you very much, Petra. Linas, the floor is yours. Yeah, Nico, interesting questions uh, from you about this geopolitical or shying away from all this title. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a believer uh, when it comes to the, uh, well, fixing in the documents that's non-geopolitical, but in reality, it's, it's not the case, basically. And also nice to be non-confrontational. I also understand and uh, Pierre, as always, was very, very wise in his insights, but uh, we, we have no purpose to be confrontational. But uh, if you have evil's force, uh, you have to stand, you know, with that. You have to withstand and have to react. And I'm always saying that we are playing in this geopolitical field, the same game, like soccer, uh, but uh, other side playing rugby at the same time. And this is really, without confrontation, you cannot survive, basically. And uh, without defending values, that's the most important. Not just our values and uh, values uh, which are with us, but also values for which uh, our partners are fighting. They also must be defended. And it's, if it's not defended, if uh, play is not fear, it's really difficult to achieve. So my point is that although in our documents is said that uh, this... Uh, partnership, Eastern Partnership Program is not, not geopolitical. Uh, by, by far, it's definitely, it's not, uh, not for enlargement. It's also true. But it's also not a secret that some of uh, these countries, so especially associated countries, they would like to get closer to European kitchen. And you cannot deny that, you know, you cannot uh, neglect, basically, and you cannot deny them from choosing this Euro European way which is, as you all know, so difficult to put into the, on, the, on the paper. And we are very careful in drafting this uh, uh, European, so to say, aspirations. Uh, but uh, this is European perspective. This is European way. You cannot deny these countries signed agreements with European Union, not, not with Asian Union. They are approaching European uh, single markets. Uh, they are approaching uh, European standards and trying to do that. So. Uh, it's not geopolitical, uh, I'm not sure, because this is definitely something which is really big, big game. Also, when it comes to uh, confrontation or not, uh, uh, definitely it's not a purpose, uh, not our, we shouldn't aim at that to, to be confrontational, but we have to defend, as I said. And when stability is the only uh, reason we are trying to act uh, actively to, 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 to grant that stability is coming, it's also not the case. Uh, we have seen uh, the only, uh, only island of stability, or rather to say island of stagnation, was Belarus. Are we for that stability? I'm not sure. People now trying to liberate. They're trying, uh, desperately trying to fight for their rights. And uh, are we active enough to supporting them? I'm not sure. When talking about conflicts, again, we didn't mention yet today, but let's mention the Karabakh conflict and uh, there was Minsk group, which was put aside, and Turkey and Russia managed all things uh, according their own, so to say, national interests. And he, where is geopolitics here? Again, uh, we have really to be proactive here and uh, definitely more ambitious. So, uh, in short, I believe uh, we should understand that even uh, factually uh, or, or, or legally, it's not geopolitical, but the fact that it is, we should be ambitious enough to take this reality. Uh, also to withstand, as I said, and trying to kind of neutralize uh, unfriendly actions of those who are not following rules. And again, I have Russia in, in mind, uh, definitely, because the methods they're applying are definitely nothing to do with any democratic me methods and the selective approach towards international law also is the case. So we have to take it into account. I'm not calling for unfair play from our side, definitely it's not the case, but we should take into account that our other side plays uh, not, not accordingly, and that's, that's really important. On vaccine, everything was said. I have nothing to add because I don't know this in details, this thinking. I have to, have to say just that's again that we should be really more active in this vaccine diplomacy, especially to supporting partners. 
uh, it's done, but it's not enough. And uh, we see what uh, other countries doing. Again, Russia, well, for them, everything is geopolitics. Everything is politics, be it culture, be it sports, be it vaccines. And the least uh, vaccinated population in the country, uh, total death uh, of, uh, is the highest, as we all know. And uh, export of Sputnik vaccine is really most active comparing with others. Uh, exactly illustrates uh, the situation that for them it's very important to come up with this vaccine diplomacy to spread the influence and to use this as, as a political tool, not as something uh, just uh, which we which should should improve the health situation around the globe. Something something different, different tasks. So here again, we should take into account and to be a bit more active and sometimes even maybe more vocal. As Pierre mentioned, uh, one third of vaccines, if uh, really are shared with the partners or sold or, or, or distributed, or whatever means, this is really a big, big deal. It's an important uh, number. It's not not known for people basically, and I believe we should should use it, and especially putting emphasis on those closest partners and Eastern partners and Western Balkans uh, countries in particular. I believe there would be sufficient resources for that uh, to find. Thank you. Thank you very much, Linus. And since uh, Moldova and Romania were mentioned, I would just like to give you an example of uh, how vaccine diplomacy works in that part of the world. I find it very interesting. So uh, from the vaccines that Moldova got, 300,000 came as a donation from Romania. 150,000 came from China as a donation. 142,000 came from Russia as a donation of Sputnik. COVAX gave a donation of 86 and the United uh, Arab Emirates 2000. So that's the list of, uh, you know, that's the kind of a local map of vaccine diplomacy in a small neighboring country, which I find interesting. And uh, the numbers and the shares of, of vaccine support and diplomacy probably are not very different in the Balkans, um, which, you know, makes me uh, ask myself some questions anyway. I, that was, uh, thank you very much for your answers. Okay, thank you very much for your answers. Now I will uh, go through some of the questions asked through the questions and answers uh, chat box to the speakers. Um, so uh, Petra, you have a few questions specifically addressed to you. Uh, one is whether these difficult negotiations on the Eastern Partnership Summit Declaration are not another um, another reason to uh, to realize, well, we all do, that we need more differentiation in the Eastern Partnership and uh, new formats of deepening cooperation with the associated countries. Another question uh, relates to whether you can expand a bit on the degree to which the Eastern Partnership is also uh, open to addressing issues of uh, mainstreaming gender equality, uh, women's economic empowerment. Um, and here, I would say that even if, despite the fact that uh, two presidents out of six in the Eastern Partnership countries are women, which is uh, which is a decent rate, rate proportional rate of uh, of of uh, women representation in politics, there is a lot of uh, needs and uh, even urgencies that need to be done in the region on uh, on the emancipation of women front. And another question is that. We use this language of economic recovery post COVID, but uh, the question is to what degree uh, and you know, if you could share some details as to whether uh, the envisaged economic assistance to the Eastern partners really factors in not just the issue of recovery, but also of uh, sustainable green growth and going beyond the pre-existing economic model. That's a con conversation we have inside the European Union, but you know, if you could share a bit your thinking as to how we can not just reproduce, but make a leap forward in EU assistance and support to Eastern partners as well. A few more questions. So uh, there's some questions as to how, you know, do we embed the Eastern partnership in wider regional dynamics on whether Central Asia could become a part of the Eastern partnership uh, and on some other issues. Uh, there's this kind of underlying comparison of uh, some of the countries in the Eastern Balkans, uh, in the Western Balkans and the Eastern Partnership states when it comes to either uh, reform or non-reform dynamic or the role of third players and powers who have been 
pushing back against European influence, not just in the Eastern Partnership and and but also in the Balkans. So if you have some ideas and you know if you can share any of your considerations as to how these different regions compare, we could enlarge the conversation into that direction as well. Now, another question is related to uh, potential cooperation on the security front with selected Eastern partners. And one of the questions there is what could be done on the CSDP cooperation front? What could be done on the conflict management front? Uh, there's a specific question as to whether and what could the e European Union do more on Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, South Caucasus and Armenia and Azerbaijan. Um, and the question I would have is uh, what can the European and whether the European Union could do more on capacity building when it comes to security cooperation with the neighbors? Uh, these are some of the question and another kind of specific question and you can pick and choose whatever makes you uh, feel uh, least comfortable you should try and address that question. There's a question as to uh, what happens uh, in the conversation on the strategic compass regarding the Eastern Partnership, where states, whether the Eastern Partnership states are fully integrated in the European Union's thinking and work on the strategic compass, whether you can share anything from that diplomatic um, process. And then I have another big picture question, and I hope uh, you apologize that I go back to this, but I think that most of Eastern Partnership conversations um, deal with, you know, the scope of Eastern Partnership. So maybe today is a good opportunity to dig deeper and a bit into this geopolitical Europe, Russia, and the Eastern Partnership. And uh, Pierre and Linas, you had, um, you elaborated a little bit on this issue of confrontation and accommodation. And Pierre, I completely agree that uh, uh, being geopolitical does not necessarily and should not necessarily mean that you need to be more confrontational. At the same time, if I look at the last 10 years or so of European, of EU relations with Russia, I would see a very interesting mix of cooperation and confrontation. I think we have something of an optical illusion of seeing relations with Russia as being mainly confrontational in recent years, especially after Ukraine. Uh, that's true, there are sanctions, there are nasty summits, uh, tough exchanges at all political levels from presidents to foreign ministers to high representatives uh, to embassies. There is a lot of that. Um, at the same time, I do see a lot of strategic accommodation of Russian security and geopolitical interests. NATO and EU enlargement uh, to the east, to Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova is not something that is actively discussed. Uh, the membership action plan offer to Georgia and Ukraine uh, has not materialized since 2008. And I don't see this being anywhere near implementable in the near future or even uh, midterm future. Um, the European Union uh, speaks much less about human rights issues in Russia. Uh, there was a spike in the language around the Navalny affair. But actually, if you look up until Navalny for 10 years, I think the European Union leaders and member states and heads of state have actually been expressing public concern about the state of Russian uh, political processes less than they did uh, 15 or 20 years ago. I think on that front, uh, even Jacques Chirac, who is highly appreciated in Russia, probably spoke more about human rights issues in Russia than, uh, than many of European leaders in the last uh, 10 years. So on that, I do see a major accommodation of Russian uh, you know, concerns even the sanctions, the way they have been uh, chosen is mainly to target persons, not the economy, and they are designed in a way as to minimize, uh, you know, disruption. Nord Stream is the Nord Stream 2 is being built. Um, gas supplies from Russia to Europe have been uh, hitting all historical records in the last three, four years, reaching uh, 200 billion cubic meters a year, and that is completely unprecedented in the last 30 or 40 years. So on a lot of issues, the Europeans have been very accommodating to Russia, uh, mostly related to Russian strategic uh, and geopolitical concerns and domestic political concerns. Um, so 
At the same time, things are not going very well in EU-Russia relations. Uh, and presumably, this balance of confrontation and accommodation is not very satisfactory to the European Union. So my question to you is, you know, how do we redress this balance between uh, confrontation and accommodation to Russia? Do you think we can, the way to a more stable Eastern Europe is to accommodate Russia more? And if the European Union should do so where, on what issues, and what would be the consequences? Or, or on the contrary, the European Union should just accept and be readier to be on some issues more confrontational as a way to promote its interests? Uh, and if yes, what would be these issues? And I know that you started talking about, but if we can dig a bit deeper into that. Um, or we stay with the current balance, which is uh, tactically, I think, quite confrontational on Russia, but strategically is quite accommodationist. Uh, but I don't see actually looking across Europe, I don't see a lot of leaders or people or diplomats who are actually satisfied with the current balance. Uh, so what's the way forward if we want Europe to have a greater say on, on these issues? And I always like this uh, French expression co called the rapport de force. Um, so how do we strengthen Europe's rapport de force vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia and vis-a-vis -vis the Eastern partners? Is it for more accommodation, more confrontation? Uh, because it's a legitimate desire for the European Union to be better heard. I'm sorry for this long and uh, windy ways of uh, formulating these questions, but um, I just realized that they are probably a good contextual uh, framework for the more specific Eastern Partnership related issues that uh, we discuss regularly. So with this, I uh, go back to the speakers. Each of you has four and a half minutes, uh, which is, I think, generous enough by the standards of today's Zoom calls. Um, and I don't know where to start. Petra, do you want to start with the specifics and then we can go yeah. into yeah, I will go for specifics indeed, and then uh, uh, you can unleash the beast uh, <laughs> on the, the one of the very tricky questions. Exactly, uh, Russia is present everywhere in the Eastern Partners, uh, uh, in the partnership, and uh, yeah, it's a uh, very, very interesting and tricky question at the same time. Well, I would like to go back to the questions on, on the joint declaration and whether it's difficult and well, uh, looking back on uh, when we were having the internal discussions on the on the preparation of the summit in autumn, uh, when you look back, uh, in fact, each of the uh, negotiations on JN declaration were extremely difficult. Uh, of course, we are now in a completely different uh, different uh, framework and uh, in the different uh, uh, different. Um, more tense environment, but uh, but still, uh, we we strongly believe that there is a merit uh, of the Eastern Partnership to include all six countries, and uh, and we we know exactly that uh, some of them want to advance further and uh, and develop further uh, closer relations uh, with the European Union, and they have all these opportunities uh, on the bilateral track through the um, DCFTAs and association agreements, but also through um, multilateral track and um, or sectoral cooperation. So I would not see a bit. Uh, I would not see any any reason for the split of the Eastern uh, Eastern Partnership. The, uh, the the opportunities for closer cooperation in sort of what I call always the different fluid bubbles is there. You know, it's uh, it's basically the the framework still gives a good potential for those countries who want to work. Uh, and I don't mean only uh, the three associated. But there, there can be also the, uh, more uh, cooperation, for example, through the Black Sea angle, more on connectivity, uh, also with, uh, with an Eastern Partnership, uh, Black Sea region and uh, Central Asia. Uh, and, uh, this was one of the questions which was, uh, was raised uh, as well. So um, in, for us, uh, I would say the differentiation and inclusivity are the, the main uh, principle which will still be there. And despite the fact that we expect that the negotiations will be difficult, uh, we should uh, we should try, and uh, we very much believe we will find uh, the common uh, common denominator. 
I saw Anna's questions on uh, on uh, on the rule of law. Anna, hi. Um, yes. Uh, so on the future agenda, we, we very much hope we will be very very soon in a position to disclose uh, uh, all the details. We are still working and fine tuning the the final. Uh, well, giving the final touch uh, to, to the documents. Rest assured that uh, post-COVID recovery does not, uh, does not uh, mean that, uh, that the rule of law, uh, judicial reforms, uh, or like what we call fundamental first are neglected. On the contrary, I said many times also in my previous intervention, and I repeat once, uh, once more, uh, rule of law, good governance, uh, uh, and all the all the related issues are there and uh, are the prerequisite for any further uh, further cooperation. And of course, we have more for more and less for less principles, and this will be reiterated in uh, in uh, our future agenda uh, as well. You also asked about uh, gender. Uh, of course, uh, we will build uh, on the achievements uh, of uh, of the last uh, last ten years. And we will continue to promote gender equality and women's uh, empowerment across all the policy uh, areas. Uh, so you will uh, you will see and you will uh, you will then read uh, read a lot. Uh, this is one of the the important topics uh, as well as youth. Uh, it will be mainstream in all the all the all the important uh, areas. We will su suggest measures uh, to empower women uh, and uh, use their potential in the labor force uh, to look into work-life balance, uh, pay gap, and so on. Exa and this is exactly the area on gender where we both, uh, European Union and partner countries, can uh, can exchange the best practices and lessons learned. Because we still, uh, I, my personal view is that uh, we still have uh, some gaps on both sides. Uh, on Russia, uh, I would just uh, reiterate what uh, uh, High Representative is saying uh, on uh, on the policy. We are continuing to implement the five principles. For us, uh, especially for my colleagues and my, my team, uh, the most important principle number two: enhance the cooperation and engagement with the with the partner countries. So we go into that direction, and uh, our future future agenda will very much uh, be in uh, in these uh, in these lines. Uh, uh, I would probably stop here, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear from Linas and uh, Pierre uh, on on the, the on the last question you posed, uh, uh, Nico. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. So now Pierre and Linas, I uh, while Petra was speaking, I came I came up with a, a with a way to trap you, but of course you are super experienced diplomat, so you will easily avoid that trap. Nonetheless, if you can, uh, you know, deliberately, not entirely avoid it, uh, maybe we can come up with something interesting. So, um, Linas, uh, I, I asked this question about, you know, the balance between cooperation and, and confrontation and accommodation of Russia on Eastern partnership issues. So, Linas, the question to you would be, uh, where do you think the EU could be more accommodationist to Russia? Um, as a way to bridge the internal conversation and what can we expect in exchange from those states which don't want more confrontation with Russia. So where are you ready or where do you think uh, one could yield a bit more to those who want deeper and a calmer dialogue with Russia? And Pierre, and the question to you is the opposite of that. Uh, where do you think the European Union can assume to be more confrontational on, on Russia in Eastern European affairs um, and that includes the Eastern Partnership, but if you want to kind of uh, say something on the Balkans, that's also fine. So where do you think the Europeans need to be more confrontational as a way to get what they want in Eastern European security, both vis-a-vis -vis Russia and the Eastern partners? Um, and how do we go about it in our own internal choreography? And while you think also, Linas, there was a specific question to you, given your recent trip to Paris, was also to just outline uh, briefly where do you see the biggest overlap and coincidence in approaches between France and Lithuania on uh, the Eastern partnership issues? And where do you see issues where more work and more dialogue needs to be done to bring the two sides approach uh, together. Pierre, would you want to go first? Yes, yes, and I will uh, try to answer your question, Nico, but just 
first of all, let me just go in a little bit more into this um, uh, into this uh, opposition between confrontation and accommodation, as you put it, because I would put it a bit in a different way. It, it's more about dialogue and firmness. I prefer these two words uh, because maybe they're more diplomatic, but I think they are more straight to the point. And, and maybe to answer your question, this is what diplomacy is all about. This is what we need to do all time. And, and this is why I'm somewhat puzzled from time to time by how we have lost this um, natural diplomatic uh, language to some extent. After all, just look at what has happened in recent days uh, between the US and, and Russia. Uh, Joe Biden at the same time has decided to go ahead with more sanctions against Russia uh, for all the reasons we know, and at the same time called President Putin to inform him about this, and at the same time propose a meeting between the two of them in order to avoid more escalation. Uh, will it work? We will see in, in the few weeks ahead. But it seems to me that this was a very traditional old school diplomacy that sometimes we have started to forget. Um, and let me come back to the point I was stating earlier, the right balance between what you call confrontation and accommodation comes out if you know where you are and where you want to go. If you understand the political environment in which you are, uh, uh, avoid doing some missteps um, and not try to uh, uh, run out of uh, reality. This is really what it's all about. One of the problems the EU is facing, in my opinion, is a problem of identity. Europe is struggling for the last 20 years and it has been going ahead. I think since Maastricht, when it decided to have a common European foreign policy, um, it has struggled to try to identify what that foreign policy would be. Normative power, soft power, uh, a geopolitical uh, player nowadays. Um, we've never been able to really uh, identify what we want it to be. And therefore we sleepwalking into the reality of today, which is a reality of uh, power politics without yet knowing exactly who we are. And therefore the balance between what I call firmness and dialogue is very difficult to set up uh, if we haven't right at the start understood where we are and what we want to be. And for me, the um, mention you made about Chirac, I, I could have added François Mitterrand, is a very interesting one. Because uh, if you look back at what happened, unfortunately, with Joseph Borrell in Moscow, it all reminded me of François Mitterrand's visit to Moscow uh, at the time of the Cold War, where very openly in the official dinner he was given in the Kremlin, he came out talking about human rights. And that did not prevent the bilateral relationship between Russia and France, uh, Soviet Union at the time, sorry, uh, to go ahead. Um, so there was a way of talking about human rights without giving the impression that you want to, um, you know, interfere or lecture. Uh, there was a way of saying that. That's on the uh, accommodation part, if you want to. On the confrontation part, I would say, uh, forget a little bit about confrontation with Russia and think more about how to have a smart, proactive and more agile foreign policy in all the fields, in all the issue where here and there we may be facing Russia. It's not about having a Russian policy, it's about having a Libyan policy or Syria policy or Ukrainian policy um, of knowing where we want to be once again and how we want to improve our act on all those very difficult conflicts we're facing here and there. It's by doing that uh, that we will become, in my opinion, a relevant player as the EU which is not exactly the case today. Um, think about the Middle East, think about Africa, think about Sahel. Everywhere we're facing, to some extent, Russia's presence and influence. 
And I would say to some extent, it's natural. Uh, Russia wants to play its part in all these regions. So be it, let's accept it. But let's show in front of this Russian presence and influence that we also can be a relevant player, uh, that we know what we want to do and what we want to be in these regions. Um, this is where we need to improve our act, upgrade our foreign policy. This is what geopolitical actor is all about, in my opinion. Stop there. Thank you very much, Pierre. Linas? You know, how to say it in short now? <laughs> well, first of all, on this um, Eastern Partnership, right? Uh, and uh, when we look, all, all agreed that we have to advance, we have to show some progress and build on, on, the, on the achievements so far and not to retreat. So that means I would like to see more understanding in concrete terms of the need uh, to have better access of our partners uh, for our single market, I will repeat. It's not, not sufficient understanding so far. Uh, should be more understanding that regardless of the fact that this is not geopolitical per se, so to say, program, but by nature it is geopolitical. There's lack of understanding for up to now. Uh, also, I believe that associ associated, uh, associated countries shouldn't be kept hostage, hostages by inclusiveness, uh, to put it like that, because uh, both principles are uh, very important, inclusiveness and self-differentiation, but it shouldn't be kept as a hostages and to stop them, because sometimes this common denominator could be not sufficient for those who are more active, and that's uh, also obvious. Uh, it's nothing to do with any, any discrimination, by the way, because countries choosing themselves, how deep and how far they would like to go in relations with the European Union. We should be more creative in creating platforms on security cooperation, by the way. And there are concrete examples. There's PESCO, now open for third countries, uh, hybrid fusion uh, center or, or, or cyber, cyber security agency of European Union. We really can create platforms engaging uh, partners, uh, those willing to, to do that. And I have, have no doubt that they will uh, not just profit themselves, but it will also enrich EU thinking because they have firsthand, so to say, witnessing of these threats uh, on their, uh, their own countries, uh, how they're facing. So in short, that would be uh, something what I'm missing so far and could be improved in the future. Uh, when about Russia, difficult to, to say in short, but you know, we shouldn't retreat. We shouldn't uh, have any concessions. We shouldn't have every, every, any caveats with regard to the international rules. They must comply to the rules. And if necessary, we must confront, by the way. Let's not shy away. We must confront the behavior like this when they are trying to occupy the neighboring countries, annex Crimea, aggression against Donbass, terrorizing Georgia, uh, and, and poisoning own, so to say, opponents, right? And downing MH17, and, uh, which is also, also they are not, uh, not ex admitting that they are part of that. So this is really not tolerable, and we must confront uh, this behavior. That's, that's my point, not being aggressive, but be consistent in our demands. We are not consistent. Sometimes we are uh, expressing quite clearly what, they, what we expect Russia to do or hope Russia will do or, 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 or so to say, wish them to do. They're doing literally nothing and we are uh, retreating and uh, uh, showing some flexibility. This is not a position, I believe, because it's take, taken immediately as a weakness uh, by, by Russia and they continue with that behavior in the future. So dialogue, tough dialogue, definitely it should be. Uh, clear messaging, uh, not vague and foggy messages, because it's not politesse from from point of view of Russia. And uh, that's also applicable to the partnership, because uh, they are uh, trying to expose their influence, uh, treating some countries as a backyard, and we shouldn't allow to do that simply. So this is impossible to do without any confrontation. It should be some confrontation without aggressiveness, but at, at the same time with the tough and clear messaging. So. Since no, no more time, that's maybe that, that's it probably. Just thanking Nico for opportunity to take part in this. Thank you very much. But I think uh, was a wonderful way to discuss the Eastern Partnership. We have been both very specific and very big picture. Uh, and it's actually now I realize quite rare that the two dimensions and the two conversations actually take place on the same panel. So thank you very, very much for this uh, wonderful strategic uh, uh, conversation, but also very rich on uh, the kind of details and the mechanics and the tactics of Eastern Partnership. 
now ha half jokingly uh, while uh, while you know waiting for this event to go online we just realized that uh, all of us speak french here so maybe at some point we'll come with a similar uh, panel uh, in french let's see if this works or not uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Pierre, Lina, Pietro, it was great seeing you. And thanks a lot for the participants for their questions. We have not managed to address all of them. But uh, you know that we will not go away from this uh, topic. We'll be back and we'll continue the conversation and we'll uh, address those questions which we did not manage to address today.